Chapter Nineteen of Mister Trunnell, Mate of the Ship Pirate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Mister Trunnell, Mate of the Ship Pirate, by T. Jenkins Haynes, Chapter Nineteen. It was quite dark before the pirate had come up with the wreck. The skipper and Trunnell had gone below to their supper, and I had charge of the deck, with orders to heave the ship into the wind when we came abreast, and sing out for the mate to man the boat. We were barely able to make within half a mile dead to leeward, but when we did, I backed the main yards and clued up the courses, taking in the royals to keep from drifting off too fast in the gloom. Trunnell came on deck and gave orders to get out the boat. She was soon at the channels, jumping and thrashing in the sea, for the breeze was now quite strong. The mate jumped into her with four men, and Thompson went to the break of the poop and told me I could go below to supper. Chips and the steward came aft also, and we made out to eat a square meal in silence, each making a sign to his neighbor toward the back of his belt. While we ate, listening for the sound of oars that would tell of the return of the boat, we could hear snatches of the sad talk of the two women in the after-cabin, through the bulkhead. This did not tend to raise our spirits, and we hurried through to be on deck when Trunnell returned. Scarcely had we gained the main deck when we heard the regular sound of the oars and oarlocks. Soon the dim shadow of the boat was seen heading toward us, outlined against the light in the eastern sky where the moon was rising. We took our places at the waist and awaited developments. Jackwell stood directly above me, and I could see his face with its glinting eyes turned toward me. His moustache was waxed into sharp points and curved upward, while his protruding chin and beak-like nose appeared to draw even nearer together. He was evidently quite well satisfied that he would be able to take care of his passengers, for he said nothing to me to indicate that he was disturbed by my proximity to the gangway. I had decided to shoot Andrews the moment he came over the side, without a word. This much I had confided to Chips and Johnson. They would stand by me if there was a general attack, and we would make the best terms possible afterward. The boat drew close aboard, and I could see the backs of the rowers swing fore and aft to the stroke. Then she shot alongside and was fast to the mizzen channels, and I stepped back ready for action. Jackwell noticed my move and drew his pistol. I drew mine, and glancing around I saw that the carpenter and Johnson were standing near, with their weapons at hand, and half a dozen sailors with them. I would not be alone. A form sprang over the side, and I raised my weapon almost before I knew it. Then I recognized Trunnell. "'You can disarm that young fool, Trunnell,' said Jackwell, putting away his gun. "'It's lucky for him you've come back without any one, or I'd have shot him in half a second more.' The little mate came down the poop steps and went up to me. "'You better go below, Rolling,' said he. "'I didn't tell him,' he added under his breath, "'that you had said you'd mutiny afore I left, or he would probably have done for both you and Chips.' He doesn't even know now that Chips was with you. So get into your room and pipe down." I was so dazed at Trunnell coming back alone I could hardly talk. I looked again over the side, to see if there was no mistake. All the men were now aboard, and only the empty craft was there, dancing at the end of her painter. Then I turned and followed the mate below, he stopping just long enough to give orders to hoist in the boat and swing the yards. Jackwell went to the wheel, and away the ship went to the westward, leaving the shadowy thing there on the eastern horizon to mark the end of a fine ship. I stopped a moment to look at the derelict, and the rising moon cast a long line of silver light across the sea. Out in that shining track a dark stick rose from the water. That was the last I saw of the Sovereign. Where were they? I asked Trunnell, as we came into the cabin. "'Well,' said the little mate, coolly, "'since you've worked yourself up so much over the matter, 
and as we're a-going along on our course again, as I suggested to the skipper afore we raised the rack, here he went to the pantry and brought out a bottle and held it out to me. No, I said, I don't want anything to drink. Tell me what became of the fellows on the wreck. It's my second watch, if I remember right, and I'll be ready to turn out at eight bells. Well, said Trunnell, where they is and where they is not stumps me. Where a feller goes when he dies is mostly a matter of guesswork so I don't know as I can say exactly just where them fellers is at. Here he took a long drink, and wiped his mouth on the back of his hand. I put my gun in my room, and sat down at the cabin table, where he held the bottle as though undecided whether to take another drink, or put it away in the pantry. Rum appeared to be easy of access on the ship, and I knew I could get it any time I wanted it. "'Well, you see, the way of it were like this.' went on the mate. I didn't take no stock of those fellers being aboard a ship what had been afire. So when you went into stays and swore to do bloody murder and sudden death to them fellers, I didn't let on to the old man. What's the use? says I. We ain't a-going to bring em back no ways. Weren't they aboard? I asked. Trunnell gave me a long, keen look. Be you tellin' of this yarn, Rolling, or me? he said. I asked his pardon for interrupting. "'As I were a-sayin', afore you put in your oar, when I hears that you both had told the truth of the matter of the fight, it appeared to me that them fellers couldn't be aboard that wreck. I told the old man so, but he were for standin' along after them anyways. Then I were clean decided that the wreck had done for them.' "'Wasn't there a sign of them aboard?' I asked again. "'There's such a thing as being inquisitive,' said Trunnell, looking at me with his keen little eyes from under their shaggy brows. "'Them men ain't on that rack, and I told the skipper so, see?' He pulled out his sheath-knife, went to the door of the cabin, and flung it clear of the ship's side. Then he came back. "'There's some such thing as justice on ships, when the fellers go too far. But discipline is discipline.' The sooner you get that through your head, the better. As for them men with Andrews, they had give up any right to live afore I got there. I told the old man that the chances were again their being found there. I comes back and reports that they ain't there. That's all. Where they is, I don't much care. There is plenty of sharks in this here ocean, and some parts of them is most likely helping them. The rest is mostly in hell, I reckon. But as I says afore, that is a matter of mostly guesswork. A dim idea of the horror he had gone through came upon me. Good God, Trunnell, I said, did you do it alone? Well, there were only one strong one in the lot. But look here, young man, if you don't turn in pretty soon, you'll be in trouble again. He poured himself out another drink and put the bottle in the pantry. Then he went on deck, and I turned in to think over the spectacle that must have occurred aboard the blackened derelict. I could see Andrews's hope and the third mate's joy at being rescued. I could even picture them undergoing the wild joy I had just felt myself when we had sighted the pirate. Then came that nameless something. Had the men seen it? A rescuer coming aboard with a bloody knife in his belt and the ship standing away again on her course for the States on the other side of the world. There would be no explanations, and the blackened wreck, half sunken in the swell, would tell no tales. Trunnell was really a strange character. "'Discipline is discipline,' I seemed to hear him saying all my watch below. His step sounded above my head as he walked fore and aft, during his watch and during the periods of fitful slumber I enjoyed before eight bells struck, I fancied him a great giant whose feet struck with the thunderous sound at every stride. I was almost startled when his great bushy head was thrust into my room door, and he announced loudly that it was the mid-watch, and that I would need a stout jacket to ward off the cold. End of chapter